I noticed Chert, the head ranger, was like looking over the the veranda and he said to me and Ty, he said, I think there might be a tiger coming. And I said, what makes you say that? And he said, listen, he said, something's bothering the deer. Um, you dislike how some Thai people fawn over money. You told a great story of you on an airplane and the um, encounter with a very wealthy Thai person. Tell us, have you made any really good friends over the years that you've been here? I will tell you, he's a, he was a member of a very famous American family, probably one of the most famous American families ever. How's it going folks? Pete here from Tyrish Times. What's the story? How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well here on a Wednesday morning in Bangkok. I say Wednesday morning, but if you look behind me, I've got the curtains pulled. I'm trying to make it look like it's night time. You know what, the way YouTubers do that, you know, the nice, nice lighting. Anyway, I digress. We're going to meet a gentleman today called Carl. And some of you will be familiar with Carl. He has a YouTube channel where he hikes up mountains and goes through forests and crosses rivers all in Thailand. It's amazing stuff. I like his channel a lot. And Carl has been coming to Thailand for 35 years. So in this interview, we're going to talk to him about his life in Thailand, the things he's done and the people he's met. Because he has some interesting stories, let me tell you. So without further ado, let's get into the interview. Oh, one more thing. We filmed this interview at a Bangkok condo. And if you're interested in having a look at that condo, I'll leave two videos in the description. You can check out the building and check out the rooms if you're interested. Anyway, if you can, like the video, leave me a comment, share the video if you can, and subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Right, let's go meet Carl. All right, Carl, how's it going? Yeah, 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 good, Pete. Good, yeah. Cheers, I appreciate you coming up here from Pattaya to do this interview today. No so. problem at all, mate. Now tell us about your life growing up, because you're, you're from the UK, right? You're from London. Yeah. What was it like growing up in London as a kid? It was okay, you know, it was pretty good. I was brought up in a place called Northwood, which is probably the most famous because it's got the big uh, NATO base there, Northwood headquarters. Nice suburb of London, you know, just kind of nice balance. You can get on the underground and get into London in 30 minutes, or you can equally, you can be out in the green belt in no time at all, you know. Although it's the suburbs, there's like five or six golf courses within a couple of miles. So, uh, yeah, yeah, nice. It was, yeah, perfectly pleasant. Did you have any hobbies when you were growing up? I was always a bit outdoorsy. And when my mates were going fishing, I used to go and catch snakes. <laughs> Just sort of like grass snakes, sometimes adders, you know. Uh, that was it, really. You know, at that time, I wasn't, I wasn't into travel. That kind of came later. Right, so I saw one of your videos, and it said you first came to Thailand in 1987. That's right. That's the year I was born, right? <laughs> yeah. So, 1987. What was Thailand like back then? It was another world. Peter, you know, for me, it, it was another world, you know, and it, it wasn't just the fact that it was different back then, it was the fact that you weren't so aware of the differences, you know, kind of like everybody these days has got some image of Thailand, has got some awareness about it, but in those days, people knew a, not le uh, knew a lot less about it, so all you really picked up was what you heard from people, you know, the occasional documentary on TV, and what you heard from friends and that. So it was totally new world for me. I'd never been in the tropics before. I'd never seen a palm tree before. I'd never seen a whole coconut before. And when you came over here, were you here for a couple of weeks or how long were you here for in 1987? That first trip was just under three months. So it was, it was a good length. Three months. Yeah. Now, I've been a bit curious because I've been looking at your channel and I was thinking, has he stayed in Thailand for 35 years or has Carl gone back and forth or, you know, did he live in, in the UK and then come back over here? Uh, it's Sorry. been back and forth. I mean, I, I've lived in Thailand various uh, various points. This time I've lived here since 2016. The first time I lived in Thailand was 1990. So, but I've spent time here every year since 1987. Okay. 
So the next thing I saw on your channel was you mentioned in 1991, you were teaching English in Bangkok and then you moved from teaching English to being a tour guide in Khao Yai National yeah. Park. Yeah, yeah, that was 1990, that yeah. Yeah, that was 1990. Uh, yeah, what happened was I, I was teaching English at uh, ECC Siam Square, you know, and I, you know, it was all right, but I didn't enjoy it that much. And it was coming up to a holiday, you know, a Songkran holiday. And they, uh, we were, where I was staying, so I see bump in, they had posters, someone to put posters down. And I looked at one of them and it was offering tours to Khao Yai National Park, which, you know, I read further and it said they had wild elephants and wild tigers. And I just thought, what? They got wild tigers within a few hours of Bangkok, you know, and that. I said to my friend Mike, who's also teaching us, I said, Mike, we've got to go there, you know, this holiday. We've got these days, we've got this time off, we've got to make good use of it. And, uh, and he was up for it. So, yeah, we were a bit naive. We didn't realise that, that on the Songkran holiday, all the migrant workers travel back up north, northeast, wherever they come from. And we went to Hua Lumpong train station thinking that we were just going to jump on the train going to Pak Chong, where the tools left from. And of course we got there and the place was just totally rammed. I mean, totally. All the trains had just people in them solid. All the seats were taken. People were standing up and... Uh, I didn't like the look of look of it at all, but I just it, even in those days I could read Thai a bit, and and I remember looking out a, a couple of uh, a bit further along the lines, and I could see a couple of carriages that were marked as going in the same direction, even though they weren't attached to a train. So I said to Mike, "Look, I think these might attach to the train. You know, I think the train might pull out and then reverse on and click on. You know, should we try it?" and we decided that we had nothing to lose. There was no way we were going to we were going to travel in the in the carriages we could see. So uh, so we went across and sat in there, and sure enough, it was it, that was right. You know, the the train pulled out and then connected back on. So we had a seat, and then uh, we arrived in Pak Chong, and we were met by this guy called Bunsub, who ran Khao Yai Travel Tours, and we had a great time going around the national park. And Bunsu was a nice guy, but his English wasn't that fantastic. His English wasn't that great. So I found myself kind of having to translate for the other tourists a bit. And at the end of it, he said, look, Carl, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm teaching English in Bangkok. And he said, do you want to come and help me? And, and you know, it was, it was no contest, you know, the thought of like going through the jungle and looking for tigers and elephants or teaching English in Bangkok. <laughs> so, uh, so that was it. I just gave him my notice and I joined Cow Yai Travel, Travel Tours. Now you had an encounter with a wild tiger I've had when a you're couple. at Cow Yai. Yeah, I've Tell had a that. couple. Uh, what happened was after I'd worked there for about a year, I still hadn't seen a tiger. And one day we had some uh, Kiwi tourists, some tourists from New Zealand came up and they, they said to me, there's three of them, and they said, look, we really want to see a tiger. And I just said to them, forget it you know i've worked there for a year and i haven't seen one yet i said sometimes you find the pug marks you know sometimes you you, you hear them calling even i said but yeah, i've never seen one i said but having said that there's one area i know in the park where they do still see them from time to time and i said i know the rangers who man that ranger station deep in the jungle i said i think that if we take them some meat some chicken and some moonshine whiskey, some of the Lao Khao. I said, if we take them, they'll be pleased to see us. And if they're pleased as is, they'll probably invite us to spend the night at the ranger station, which officially they weren't allowed to do. Because the chances are, if you're going to see anything worth seeing, it's not going to be in the middle of the day. You know, you, it's, that place is quite deep in the jungle, so you'd have to, you'd have to either hike in through it in the dark or hike out in the dark, you know? So it's, the, the best option is to spend the night there. So we did it and I deliberately timed it. So we got to this ranger station about 4.30 in the evening and we arrived and said hello to them. We, we pulled out the goodies, you know, we pulled out, we had some grilled chicken, bought them some fresh pork and they, they, they were really pleased. And then I pulled out the first of these bottles of whiskey and they just immediately the head ranger just said, oh, it's getting late. You can't go back tonight. You know, you, you've got to stay here tonight. You've got to stay here. You can't hide back in the dark. So, so that was it, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd got what we wanted. And, and that night we all got drunk together, you know, we polished off his Lao Khao and, uh, 
and then we went to sleep on the veranda. <laughs> They had some blankets for us, and we slept on this veranda. It was quite cold because Cow Yai is high up, and in the mor it was a cool season anyway. In the morning, or it was the end of the cool season. In the morning, there was a, there was kind of like mild mist in the grassland. This ranger station, Cloggy Tow Ranger Station, is in the on the big grassland, and I know it's Chert. The head ranger was like looking over the the veranda, and he said to me and Ty, he said. I think there might be a tiger coming. And I said, what makes you say that? And he said, listen, he said, something's bothering the deer. And all the deer that come out to graze in the morning, they were alarmed by something. They were all like barking to each other, like that. You could hear it echoing across the grassland. And uh, he said, do you want to go and look? And I felt, well, yeah, you know, like I'm the tour guide. That's my responsibility. So I turned around and, and, and I shook one of the, uh, one of the tourists. And I shook him and I said, look, Church says there, there might be a tiger coming. And he just turned around and he said, you ain't see a tiger. You know, and I sort of thought, oh, well, you know, I'm going to go anyway. I was awake. So I remember going down the stairs from the veranda, putting on my boots, which had condensation on them. I can remember that. I remember I grabbed my camera. And we started walking to where the deer were grazing. And we got about probably about 150 metres. And then Church said, yeah, yeah, there's a tiger coming. I said, how do you know? And he said, I can hear it. He said, listen, listen, can you hear it? And I was listening. I could hear the deer barking, but I couldn't hear this tiger. And I was listening for the wrong sound, you know. I thought it would be like a lion roaring or something. And then I picked it up, you know. It was still a little bit distant, but it was like you'd hear the deer barking, and then you'd hear it like, sound like it was like, oh, like that, oh, like that. And you could just, you know, once every 10 seconds or so, you'd, you'd hear that. And then he started pointing, he said, there it is, I can see it, look, look, look. And I'm saying, where, where, you know, and I just, he was pointing, I couldn't see it. And I was thinking, oh my God, you know, I've waited all this time to see a tiger and I've missed it. <laughs> and eventually it becomes silhouetted against the bush. And I, I could see it clearly and it, it was fantastic. It was a big tiger and it was just casually strolling. Very early morning, probably about 7 a.m., uh, a bit of mist still coming up from the grassland and it was just walking along calling and it you could tell that it just wasn't hunting if it had been hunting we wouldn't have seen it you know it would have been creeping around and it, it was totally fascinating it, it was fascinating watching the deer and how they were reacting to it because the deer were alert they they were up on their top their ears were pricked up and they were barking to each other but they weren't running off they didn't run off they just stayed where they were and this and one of the deer actually followed the tiger for a while. I was about 30 yards behind it and it would just follow it and it would stretch its neck and its front legs up and just watch it and then it would just bark to the others and let them know where it was, you know. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, got to see it for about 10 minutes, got to take lots of pictures which are uh, on a video on, on my YouTube channel and uh, yeah, that was it. Yeah, marvellous. That's a really crazy story, yeah. That's because um, I watched this documentary a couple of months ago, and it, it said that like even to till about a hundred years ago, there were lots of tigers in uh, Thailand and all up through. Um, I think maybe uh, across Myanmar into India, that oh, was the yeah. area, and people were absolutely terrified of them because terrified of them because they would come in into these small villages and like literally pull people out of their beds. Do you know, I, I was really kind of confronted with something that brought what you were saying home to me. And that was, oh, it was 1991 uh, in saint clat marie not long after I'd started working at, at Khao Yai. Uh, I'd spoke to this old lady and I was the first foreigner she'd ever spoken to directly, you know, because I could speak Thai. And I was talking to her and I, I was telling her that I was working at Khao Yai and, you know, and I was telling her about, you know, like uh, tigers need protecting and everything. And I asked her if she'd ever seen a tiger and she just looked at me in Thai. She said, terrible animals. She said, tigers are terrible animals, horrible animals. And then she told me about a period she called Don Yipunma, which means the time the Japanese came, Second World War. And, and she told me that, you know, they lived in the, in the jungle and the tigers would come 
and eat all their livestock, all the cattle at night. So, you know, like every night they used to have, they used to take shifts and guys used to wait up in trees, you know, to kind of like see off any type marauding tigers that came around. And she told me that her own brother was attacked by a tiger. He was walking on a jungle tree. He was attacked by a tiger. They found him. He was badly injured. And in those days, it, it could take five days a week to get to the nearest doctors. And his wounds festered and he died. You know, he died a horrible death. And it's, it's just kind of really made me think, God, you know, we've got this kind of attitude that we've got to protect them. And, you know, everybody knows that. And now they're very real. And I'm talking to a lady who had these terrible experiences with them when she grew up and who was I to tell her that you know like her opinion of them was wrong you know it was uh, just like what you said Pete you know they, they could be a real pest well let's talk about you now for a second because um I have written down here what kind of person is Carl right and I've, I saw you say this on your channel or I heard you say this on your channel you said I have an incurable sense of adventure, and you can see it from all your videos, you're climbing up mountains, you're hiking through forests, you're doing incredible stuff, but what is it about you and adventure? I don't know, you know, I just always, always want to say more, I'm always sitting there thinking, what am I doing sitting in this room, you know, I could be doing this, I could be out somewhere, you know, if someone's up for an adventure, you know, I'm just on there, you know, yeah, yeah, let's do it. You know, like uh, tomorrow, myself and, and Jimmy, JB Wonders, you know, we're, uh, we're going, we heard a story about a man who was attacked by three tigers near the Burmese border. And he got a few details. So we're going to go off looking for him, see if we can interview him. You know, I just, I love that kind of spur of the moment thing, you know. Is it the countryside and nature that does it for you as well? Or like... I mean, how do you think of Bangkok? We're in a big, uh, big city. I mean, full of concrete. It's very hot. There's no air con here right now. We were very hot. How do you feel about living here, or would you prefer to live? It's in the still an adventure. Yeah. Yeah, it's still an adventure. I mean, yeah, coming here was a big adventure. You know, it's still an adventure. You know, like Thailand is still an exotic place for me, even though I've spent a lot, a lot of time here. It's still an exotic place. You know, I still get off on the sound of insects at night. You know, something we just don't really get in England, you know, uh, palm trees, <laughs> coconuts, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thailand is still an adventure to me, just even Bangkok. How do you feel about uh, the Thai people? They're fascinating people, uh, very different, you know, they, they could be wonderfully kind, they could be frustratingly arrogant, you know, they've got their own way of, of looking at things, of very unique people, very unique. Because I saw you made a video called, uh, Why Thailand Will Make You Crazy. <laughs> and you said in that video, and I thought this was very interesting, you said, Thailand can be a roller coaster for emotionally reactive type people. Yeah. So what did you mean by that? Well, you know, like, uh, I mean, you know, there was a, a poem by Rudyard Kipling uh, about Westerners, you know, how we tend to be very hot-headed, you know, the ties will be, and Asians in general, you know, they tend to be a lot calmer. I guess the, the climate doesn't lend itself to getting sort of too hot-headed. And you see a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of expats here just kind of get really frustrated because things don't always go the way they expect them to go. It just, they're getting angry and you can see them destroying themselves. And, and there was a, a poem by Rudyard Kipling and I'll just, you know, I might not get it precisely, but it, it was the section of it was something like, it is not good for the white man's health to hustle the Asian brown. For the white man riles and the Asian smiles and he weareth the white man down. And at the end of the fight, is a tombstone white with an epitaph loud and clear. Here lies a fool who here lies a fool who tried to hustle the East. And that was it. You know, it wasn't meant as some kind of like saying the East is superior, but it was just the kind of like it's just a perfect illustration of, of how as Westerners, you know, no, no, we want it like you know, we get like that. Does it mean that us Westerners we think that we kind of know it all and we can maybe leave our mark where the East is a different animal? It it's could different. be that, you know, it could be that. I think, you know, we, we, certainly, we certainly are brought up to expect things to be a certain way. And it's just, yeah, I just think it really is a, a cult, culture clash, you know, it's just a, a different approach, a different outlook. Is there anything that you dislike about living over here? 
because I, I, I'm gonna just, I'm, I'm gonna lead the question in now. <laughs> I'm gonna lead you down, because I saw a video and you said that um, you dislike how some Thai people fawn over money. And then you, you said, uh, you, t you told a great story of you on an airplane and the um, encounter with a very wealthy Thai person. Yeah, sure, sure. That was back in the days, I don't know, it was probably about 15 years ago. You know, I think it was 15 years. Back in the day when uh, Thai Airways frequent fly scheme was a lot more generous than it is now, I managed to get gold card, which was the top status then. And somehow I wangled it so that I got a free first class return flight in the month of my birthday, uh, London, Bangkok, Bangkok, London. Now on the return leg, yeah, I went to check in, you met at a curbside, we was taken in, uh, to somebody took our things to the check in. We were taken on a buggy to the first class lounge. Now the first class lounge had lots of little satellite lounges around it. And I remember sitting in one of these lounges eating and I remember seeing there was a family in one of the lounges and they had an armed guard. You know, they had soldiers hanging around outside and I didn't think much of it. And when it came time to board the flight, uh, the buggy come to collect me and I went, uh, I went, I got on the flight and you know, they're all a bit, it's the only time I've ever flown first class really, but the, the hostesses are all, you know, they're a lot friendlier. And they, they come up and ask your name, they get talking. And I started talking Thai with this hostess. And about five minutes later, the, the other first class passengers came in and the vast majority of them were, were this family that were under armed guard in the lounge, you know. I still to this day do not know who they were. You know, important, I don't know if it was a military person, a government figure, or even an entertainer. I don't, have, I, I don't have a clue, but anyway, he sat in the seat behind me. And before we took off, he, he turned around to the, uh, to the hostess that was talking to me and he, he said in Thai, he said, excuse me, he said, uh, this is a Thai aircraft, isn't it? And she said, yes. And she said, if this is a Thai aircraft, how come we've got a foreigner sitting in the front seat? Surely we should have a Thai person leading the way, sitting in front, you know? <laughs> and I'm just kind of like, and then she said, oh, he can speak Thai, sir. And it, without hesitating, he just said, no, Thai Peter, no, Farangs don't speak Thai. You know, he didn't even acknowledge what she said or even think about it. He just said, no, you're wrong. You know, I just thought, this is a man who is used to getting his own way, you know. How did uh, you feel when he said that, um, you know, Thai should, a Thai person should be leading the way? I thought it was very arrogant. You know, yeah, yeah I, thought it, I thought it was very arrogant. Yeah, the whole impression was like you say, you know, he was very moneyed. Yeah, he was just used to having things his own way. Now, of course, you know, you've got part of you as a reflex and you want to turn around and say, oh, yeah, we can't speak Thai. But, I, you know, I just decided, no, you know, like, this is your day. You know what I mean? You enjoy this flight. It's first class. I just, I just let him get on with it, you know. Well, so you must be kind of a patient person then. Are you patient? You come across as being quite calm. Yeah, I'm pretty calm, yeah. Yeah, I lose it once in a while, but not very often. Yeah, yeah I can tell. So one thing I like about you is that you speak Thai really well, but you don't brag about it in your videos. You do it in a nice, humble way where you speak to um, regular Thai people or people that you come across on your adventures. Yeah, and yeah. And you capture really interesting moments with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh... I just, you know, at the end of the day, it's just communication, you know, so to me, it's like, it's not really any different to, to speak in English. Yeah, you know, I'm quite happy if Thai people speak English, they're usually very proud of that fact. So by kind of letting them speak English or let them, letting them kind of uh, build face up for themselves, you know, so I just, I just let them do it. And to me, I think, uh, you, there are people who've known me for quite a long time, Thai people, and not known I speak Thai, you know, because they, because they speak English. It's just, yeah, when it's necessary, you know, when it's necessary, or when I think that my Thai is better than their English. Now, in the 90s and the late 80s, when you were coming over here, 
there were a lot of scammers. Bangkok was quite famous for, for scams oh, at that time. Definitely, Peter, definitely. I used to stay on Soi Si Bun Pen, you know, for Soi Nam Du Pli in the area around the Malaysia Hotel, and it was just scammer city. <laughs> it was just, every, every evening you'd go somewhere like Freddy's Guest House too, <laughs> and you, you'd walk in there and there, all the scammers would be sitting around the table, you know, they'd have a... What kind of scams were they doing? They were doing things like uh, credit card scams. You know, they'd get they'd get stolen credit cards, and they'd get a, a a foreigner to go shopping with these credit cards. And what they do, they take them to gold shops because you know they could you could buy gold and you can sell it for almost the same amount you can you bu you bought it for here. You know, so they'd use these credit cards to buy lots of gold, and then they go back later and sell it. Uh, Immigration ones, you know, they they used to take uh, Thai ladies to different countries. Could be Hong Kong, Australia, Taiwan, you know, wherever. Uh, America, there was a lot of them going on. Gold, there was a lot of gold bullying, smuggling. There were travellers checks. You know, people in those days, you know, no, nobody had an international hole in the wall, so they'd uh, everybody would bring travellers checks, and and you could. Uh, you could sell them at a reduced rate and then report them missing, claim a refund, and then they'd go around and try to cash the traveler's checks that you told to them. So yeah, yeah, there was a, lots of scamming. Carl, you come across as being a fella that has a lot of friends, or you're quite a sociable guy, right? Tell us, have you made any really good friends over the years that you've been here? Sure, yeah, you know, one, I think one of my best friends I ever met here was a, was a guy called Bill. You know, he was a, it was a very, uh, very interesting character, you know, he'd kind of uh, dedicating, dedicated his life to travelling. And he was quite, Bill was quite well connected, so he could have had, you know, he, he was a waiter. He was a waiter in Texas on South Padre Island, but, you know, he was very connected, so he could have had a, a much more kind of... Uh, high-flying lifestyle if he'd wanted to you know he could have like his connections could have fixed him up in virtually any job he wanted and uh, but he just loved the the traveling lifestyle this this was typical of bill this was typical of bill I, I can remember one time he said to me when he was over here he said look carl he said in a few months time a friend of mine called duff is coming out here you know she's never been to thailand before would you show her around and i said yeah, sure, Bill. Yeah, 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 no, no problem. He said, right. He said, what I'll do is I'll give you the phone number of the guest house, and, and when she gets here, I'll ask to give you a call. I said, yeah, okay, yeah, no problem. And a few months later, that I got, I was upstairs in at the guest house, and I, somebody come up, knocks on the door, and says, someone's on the phone via. So I went downstairs, and I answered the phone, and it was this lady called Duff, and she, she said, hi, Cole. She said, uh, I'm Duff. I'm Bill's friend. I said, yeah, yeah. He told me about. It about you and she said bill said that you'd show us around you know i'm here with my, my girlfriend well, i can't remember what her name was but i said sure sure duff you know what have you got in mind and i thought she was going to say shopping or the grand palace or something and she said i hear the nightlife's really good here and i said yeah 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 it's pretty good and then i said well look i could take you to see pat pong and she said oh yeah yeah bill told me about that place so I asked her where she was staying, and she said, the Oriental Hotel, which back in the 80s, I think that was voted as the best hotel in the world every year in the 80s. So I said to her, well, that isn't too far from Pat Palm, you know, and I told her how to get there, and, uh, and I arranged to meet with her at the entrance to Pat Palm, and and we met up, and I, I thought, you know, I was a bit, didn't know how she'd take to the place, you know, because Pat Bond was a, a lot wilder back then, a lot, lot wilder. And so I thought, well, I'll ease her in gently, you know. So I took her to this bar that used to be called Mike's Place that was on Pat Pong 2. It used to be near the, the car park uh, where the Georgian Dragon was. So I took her into Mike's Place because it was laid back and the girls there knew me, you know, so... I walked in there and the, and the girls sort of made a bit of a, a fuss of Duff and a friend and they, we were all talking and buying drinks and it, you know, it was all very civilised and, and then Duff turned round, him, round to me and she said, well Carl, you know, this is very nice, you know, they're nice girls and that, but, you know, I thought there'd be more to the place. So I thought, okay, you know, I'll, I'll test her a bit further and I took her to 
one of the King's group bars, you know, where the girls were a bit more sort of scantily clad and, and dancing. So I took her there and we had a couple of drinks there and she's saying, oh, they're, they're beautiful women, Cole, you know, beautiful women. But I really thought there'd be more to this place. And, and by this time I think, okay, okay, Duff, you're, you're ready, you're up for it. And in those days, one of the bars was called Super Girls. And I thought I'll take them to Supergirls and we timed it perfectly. I can't remember whether it was 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. We walked up the stairs into Supergirls and they used to have this show and they used to have a full ceiling that opened up. And we walked, we got upstairs just as this, they started playing the music and the full ceiling was opening up. And from this full ceiling, all of a sudden, a, a Harley Davidson motorcycle would be lowered on chains. And on this Harley Davidson motorcycle, there was a Thai couple and there was something going on. And Dove just looked at me really shocked and she said, is that for real? And I said, you work it out, Duff. <laughs> anyway, she, uh, she, afterwards she said, thanks very much, Cole. You know, it was a fantastic night out. She said, look, she gave me a card. She said, if you're over in New York, give me a shout. And I, I said, no, pleasure, Duff. Thank you. Thanks very much. And, and we said goodbye. And a couple of months later, Bill came back and we're sitting down the first day having something to eat. And he, he, he said to me, he said, oh, you know, Duff said, thanks very much. You know, you, you know, she had a great time. And then he said, and so, so and he named this person who was quite sort of famous. He said, and they said, thank you too. And I said, she was associated with him and he said yeah 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 that's his girlfriend <laughs> so i thought you know like <laughs> i didn't realize at the time like who i was taking out and showing all the uh the seedier side of pat pong to you know i think you know what my next question is going to be who's the famous person i i can't tell you i can't tell you he's, you can't he, tell us he's definitely still alive he's definitely still active and he's definitely still in the in the media attention. Are we talking occasionally? Very famous guy. Uh, we, you know, we're not talking like a, a film star like Tom Cruise or something like that. But yeah, yeah, especially in America. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, everybody would have heard of him. And if I push you again to give us a, maybe another clue or a name or maybe the first letter. No, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I will tell you that he's a very famous, he, he was a member of a very famous American family, probably one of the most famous American families ever. Okay, well, we'll let the audience, leave it up to the audience to, to go in the comment section. <laughs> Who is it? You can all debate it in the comment section now. Well, I want to see the comments. I want to see you hashing it out between yourselves. Who you think it is? <laughs> Remember it was 30 years ago as well. Yeah. Right, so Carl, um, are you here for the long haul? You see yourself in Thailand for the foreseeable future, oh, 5, 10, 20 years? Yeah, I want to, yeah, I want to remain here. I mean, you know, nobody knows exactly what's ahead in the future, but I'm happy here, definitely, yeah. yeah. And uh, you plan to make YouTube your, like, sole full-time income? Uh, uh, things related to it, yeah, I'd like to do something, you know, I'd like to expand it, take it a bit further, but yeah, I think, you know, I've got a knowledge of Thailand that in some ways is pretty unique, you know, because I always had that kind of adventurous streak, so, you know, I've always travelled, you know, when I, met, when I met Paddy Doyle a few months back, he, we were just having a, having a conversation when we first met, and I said, how many provinces have you got to go? And he said, well, I've got two, I've got Chat Chern Sao and then Phuket, and I said, well, Phuket was the last province I visited as well. And he said, you visited all the provinces? And I said, yeah. He said, you're the first person I've met who's visited all the provinces. He said, when did you do it? And I said, well, the last one was Phuket and that was 2002. So, and it, so I visited all of the provinces and uh, that's always been... Did you do that in one go or were you doing that like at one holiday? No, no, it wasn't like, like, you know, like Paddy's done it. You know, he's very clever. He's done it in a kind of... Uh, uh, concise idea. No, you know, what happened was I just loved traveling around. So, you know, even when I was teaching English, if we had some time off, if we had a few thousand baht in our pocket, you know, 30 years ago, myself and my friends would just jump on third class buses and we'd just hop off wherever we felt like it. And we'd always get into some adventure and uh, we just went looking around. And one day I just kind of like looked and I just thought, crumbs, is that? there's only five or six provinces that I've never actually visited, you know? So, uh, 
that was it, you know, I just thought that then it become like a mission to tick them off, but there was only sort of five or six of them at that time, you know. Which is your favourite province? Probably, it's very hard to say. Uh, at the moment, it's probably Bungan, which is the newest province. Uh, Bungan is northeast Thailand. It, I think it's in between Non Kai province and Nakhon Phnom province, but it's the newest province in Thailand. It's the 77th province. But it's just really rural, north, it's beautiful. And it's just got some of my favourite places to visit. You know, some of my favourite kind of adventurous places to visit are there. So that's probably it. But there's so many provinces I love in Thailand. What's your favourite local custom? My favourite local custom? Or how about the local custom that you saw that just like, it's like, whoa, what is this? Like, what's going on here? I'm trying to think. Uh, Favourite local custom that kind of blow me? Or some festival that you saw, or just something you saw. Yeah, you I, like, I, find, I find the Rocket Festival, up, you know, Yasaton up in the northeast, pretty uh, fascinating because, you know, you hear about it and you think it's just going to be like English fireworks or something. And it's just these great big monstrous. <laughs> Rockets that look like they could, they could go up to outer space, and all the, you know, all the passion that goes in, all the betting, and all the rivalry that goes into building the rocket that's going to go the, go the highest. You know, yeah, that that's pretty incredible. Do you know? Do really? Because I've been visiting places so long now, Peter. I said some of these things that have probably amazed people. I don't even regard as different now. You know, I'm kind of. After 35 years, I'm just kind of used to it, you know? It's, I have to shift my perspective to sort of even answer the question. Are you a spiritual person? Uh, do you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not religious. Spiritual, I think I am. But yeah, it's kind of very unique to me. I think like most people, you know, I've got my own ideas. Because you're going up to mountains that have you know, small little temples and it's completely quiet and peaceful up there. Yeah. I imagine going up there be just super tranquil and just a place that you can just look down on the world and be like, whoa, like, there has I to be just, something more I than this. What's more than this? I think it's very grounding, you know, and I think, uh, you know, just being honest, I think a lot of people could really do with that you know they kind of they get caught up in their everyday life and their life might be hectic and i don't think they really appreciate what kind of some of these places can do for them you know if you were going up a mountain on your own would you tell people before like hey i'm going up this mountain like if i'm not back in a couple of hours like send out the yeah i've never actually <laughs> sort of said that to somebody if i'm not back in a couple of hours but yeah obviously it's a sensible thing to do sometimes you know i've had the, the opposite where i've you know i've got myself in situations i think well i should have sold somebody really you know <laughs> did you ever get lost yeah yeah i've got a video where i got lost at cow Yai national park but i mean there, there was a a limitation to how long how lost i could be because i had a gps unit on me with the trail loaded but you know like in the jungle if you get off a trail even 10 meters you can't see the trail you know and uh if you're not walking on the trail you know you can be fighting for every foot just to get somewhere so you know like uh also you know in the jungle you've got no method of orientation you can't sometimes you can't even see the sun you know you've just got you can't see landmarks you can't it's does it happen often over in thailand where people are on a trail and they go off it and they get lost because in the weather over here and the insects and all that i mean if you had to spend 12 hours in the jungle let's say you come out in a bad way it certainly happened at cow yai on the trail that i got lost on yeah it, it got happened uh, it happened i think probably about four or five years ago now there were a group, maybe three tourists who went on that trail and they got lost. And I think I think they were lost for about 36 hours, which is a long time, Jeez. you know, and eventually they found them, you know, they sent out rescue people and found them. But, you know, recently it crossed my mind that that time I got lost, you know, if I, if I hadn't had the GPS on me, I hadn't told anybody I was on that trail and, you know, because of the situation people just weren't using. Do you have the survival skills to, like, stay out for an extended period of time if you do get lost? Do, do, do you know, probably, probably not, Pete. You know, I was sensible enough to have a GPS with me and, uh, and but no, you know, no, I haven't really done any of the Bell Grill stuff, Bear Grill stuff where, uh, you know, no. 
No, I'm just being honest. Yeah. I'd like to be able to tell you that I could do a Rambo and, <laughs> and jump on a wild boar with, <laughs> with a steak, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yet right. to be tested, that one. <laughs> right, so let's get into the deep questions, right? If you could go back and meet your 20 year old self, 20 year old Carl, and what advice would you give him? Oh, see, wait a few years before going to Thailand. <laughs> Why? Why is that? I think, you know, I, I run my own business from a very early age back in England. And so I was kind of, yeah, I was, I was taking that path. And uh, when I found Thailand, like the, the train definitely left the tracks in terms of anything like remotely resembling a career or anything like that, you know? So yeah, it was, it was a big, big, big distraction. Well, you've had a great adventure, you know? Oh, yeah, no, I, I didn't say adventure. I regret it, you know, okay. but it, it's just, yeah, you know, I can look back and see that in certain ways I could have been a lot more sensible. So you don't have any regrets? No, 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 you can't, no, no, you know, yeah, it's very hard, isn't it? It, it sounds a bit contradictory, doesn't it, what I've said? I would advise myself, no, no, I've had a great life, I really have, you know, there's some incredible experiences and I'm still having them. All right, well, listen, it's been a great interview. Thanks very much for your time. Yeah, thanks very much, Peter. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to for you to check out Carl's channel. I'm going to leave a link in the description. He makes great content. He's hiking up mountains. And literally, he is making content like he's climbing up a mountain to film. You know, he's not walking down the street like other people do and make an easy video. You do it in 20 minutes. He's going out for a day, days on end filming and he shows a real interesting part of thailand that not many vloggers cover so check out his channel link in the description if you like this video subscribe to our channel like and leave us a comment because it helps me out i'm always saying it. and if you can share the video because that helps me out as well so cheers thanks very much we'll see you on the next one